All right, well, welcome back, Chemistry 125 students. Uh, so this is another sort of tutorial video that we're doing today. So here's a list of what I'd like to accomplish here in the next several minutes. A uh, little bit of a clarification from last week. Uh, well, this week in lab, you did the empirical formula and I posted the video last week. There was a little bit of confusion on that one. When you do empirical formula, you're always calculating the number of moles of each atom in an experiment and then determining the empirical formula by using the, rate, the mole ratios, turning them into whole numbers and things like that. That's fine. I think the way I explained it last week, it confused some students. They thought they were doing the oxygen as O2 molecules or diatomic atoms, however your professor describes them in class. So just a little clarification there. Not, you can do it either way, but the way I described it, you'd have to account for the fact that I think I described molecules. You have to multiply by two to convert it to atoms. I don't think it was a major point of confusion, but I at least wanted to mention it. Also, the second thing here, uh, I see this happen routinely in the lab, is students confusing percent error and percent yield. Just keep in mind, those are two different calculations. Percent error, we don't need to write down the formulas. Percent error is the absolute value, you know, you put the absolute value sign there, of the experimental value that you get in any activity, minus the theoretical value, where you find it in a handbook or it's given to you. Uh, you subtract those two and then divide by the accepted value, the theoretical handbook value, and then multiply by 100. So you do a subtraction, then a division, then multiply by 100. Percent yield, there's no subtraction involved there. You take the experimental amount of a chemical that you get in a reaction, divided by the theoretical amount, called the theoretical yield, multiplied by 100. So those two are not the same, and I'll show you an example of this one, another one, today. Um, the main goal today is to introduce, really, what is one of the most important skills in a first semester general chemistry course, limiting reactants. If you understand limiting reactants, you understand not everything about stoichiometry, but you understand almost everything about stoichiometry. So this is a really important task, uh, skill to learn. Once you get it, you've got it, okay? And uh, it doesn't matter how many reactants and products, you can have 10 reactants, 10 products, it's all the same procedure. Uh, also, every instructor teaches it a little bit differently, so don't take what I'm doing today as the way you have to do it. I think we all decide, if you find a way that works for you, use it and get the right answer. Uh, you'll definitely see limiting reactive problems on the next test, certainly your final, it's one of those big things. So, not just limiting reactants, but if we're going to talk about limiting reactants, which is the chemical that gets used up or consumed first in a chemical reaction, well then the other reactants, if there are any, uh, those are excess reactants, so there's something left over when the reaction is done. So we want to look at both of those, not just one. And then also using the limiting reactant, since that limits the amount that's produced, you use a limiting reactant to calculate a theoretical yield. So we're going to do this problem here today. Um, last week in lab, or this week if you're watching the video, with the empirical formula, we reacted a piece of magnesium with oxygen. And we didn't measure the oxygen directly because it was in the air. So we just, as much oxygen came into the reaction as was necessary. Uh, with this example, I'd like to think about this reaction taking place in a closed system. So not that you need a picture of it, but let's assume rather than an open crucible, you put it in a box. And you close that box, and you put your, oh, your magnesium down here. So we can just put some magnesium atoms. It doesn't really matter. Those of you that, are, that have done this already, you know magnesium, I think, has two valence electrons. So you can even draw the dot structures down here. Not that that matters. And oxygen, O2, we could represent like this. So we're doing this in a closed system now with a fixed amount of magnesium and a fixed amount of oxygen. So what we want to do is identify which is going to get used up first, the magnesium or the oxygen. And it's not as simple as looking at the grams. Like, well, there's less magnesium than oxygen by mass, but that doesn't matter. We have to look at it by moles. So that's what I want to show you today a little bit, is how we're going to do this. Using a simple example, we'll set up the chemical equation for next week's lab, which is a really cool synthesis experiment. I'll kind of set it up for you, but then it'll be up to you to balance the equation and to do all of these calculations. All right, so let's, let's get started here. So here's the chemical reaction. It's the same chemical equation, and we need to balance it. 
you've done that already. Um, the advice I gave you last time, and also I showed you an example of a theoretical yield calculation, is to put all the data that you have right underneath. So we have 0 0.0318 grams of magnesium, 0 0.0527 grams. And we know we're going to need the molar masses. So just going to look those up. Atomic mass, 0 0.305 grams per mole. And oxygen, I think we can round this up. So we have all the information we need, and if you want to, well basically what we're trying to do, we're trying to figure out how many grams of magnesium oxide it's going to form. All right, well at some point we're going to need the molar mass of magnesium oxide. I don't remember what that is, I think it's 40 something or other. Well I guess we can just, yeah, 16, yeah let's just call that for uh, 40.305 grams per mole. I think that works. Just this basically plus 16. I think that works. Why not? Okay. If your numbers are slightly different from molar mass, that's fine. So again, what I'm going to show you here is just a one way of doing it. Uh, I just talked to Dr. Richardson and the technique I think at least two of the professors are telling you to do, and I'll start here, is to take one reactant and do the gram-gram calculation that I showed you last time and calculate the mass of the product that forms. Just go through, do the three-step calculation. Then go to the next reactant and do that three-step calculation. Just get it both times. And which one is right? Well, the one that gives you the smaller mass of magnesium oxide. So why don't I just set it up that way? And um, I think that'll just be at least a good way to show you how to do it. So if you know what to do, take 0.0318 grams of magnesium, calculate how many grams of magnesium oxide form, and then do the same thing for oxygen. So you can either start doing that on your own right now, don't wait for me, because I don't, I don't actually have the answer in front of me, I have to do it too, uh, and then go from there. I'll just set them up. This is just like last week. See, sorry about that. So that would be the amount of magnesium oxide based on magnesium. So it's basically it's very similar then for oxygen. Again, set it up on your own. So make sure you have it all set up properly. So this is kind of what I would call, no offense to Dr. Richardson and Dr. Kegeris, this is kind of the brute force method of doing limiting reactants. Take one reactant, carry it to product. Take the other reactant, carry it to product. And if I have three reactants, like you have next week in lab, you'll have to do this calculation three times. And I'll just give you a heads up, next week's chemical equation is slightly more complicated than this one. Okay, so that, but it's the same basic principle. So Ultimately, limiting reactants are all the same. It just depends on how complicated the chemical equation and chemical reaction are. 
All right, so you probably already have this done. Um, and if you know what you're doing, you don't have to wait, you can just stop the video, is we'll figure out how, which one's limiting reactant, that's fine, then we'll go back and calculate how much of the excess reactant is left over. So this is number one. All right, I just have to do the calculation here real quick, but be smart about it. Two over two is one, so I have to take 0 0.0318 times 40.305 divided by 24.305. Speed is somewhat of a necessity on a test, so learn to be efficient with your calculations. So 0 0.0318 times 40.305. Get an answer. This is an old calculator, so I can't do it all in steps. I can do it all in one step divided by 24.305. All right, and let's see. Sig figs. Looks like three sig figs in the answer. So 0 0.0527. And of course, you would never just write 0.0527. That's not enough, okay? Grams of magnesium cancel, moles of magnesium cancel, moles of MgO cancel. So the units here are grams, MgO. I find that students that just do numbers get very confused on what the answer means. And they don't know how to interpret it because there's no label. So you've got to carry the label through to show what's happening. The units, so the number, the sig figs, and the units. And the chemical formula that it's referring to. I think I did that last week too, didn't I? Oh, at least I'm consistent. So 0 0.0527. Okay, then I do have to multiply. This doesn't cancel. Okay. Times 2 times 40.305. That's everything in the numerator. Equals that. I think I did that right. Divided by 32. All right, and I got three sig figs, 0.133. Oops. Grams of MgO again. I'm going to double check that. 0.05, oops. 0.0527 times 2 times 40.0. 305 equals divided by 32. Yeah, 0.133 grams of MgO. So this is the basic calculation. If you know how to do a gram to gram calculation, you do that twice, but now it's the interpretation. Okay, doing the calculation, I think all of you can do that. That's a three-step unit conversion problem. You can do that problem without knowing any chemistry. If I give you the unit conversions, you can just do it but you have to know the chemistry of how to interpret it. So what does this mean? This means if I completely react 0 0.0318 grams of magnesium, I will produce 0 0.0527 grams of MgL. Fine. If I completely react 0 0.0527 grams of oxygen, I will produce 0.133 grams of MgL. Only one of them is right. You always take the one that gives you the smaller answer. So. Magnesium is our limiting reactant. And remember, it's limiting reactant. So when you say, what's limiting reactant? Magnesium is a limiting reactant. And everything else is excess. So it's one or the other. It either limits the reaction or it's in excess. And the introduction to the lab for the iron acetyl acetonate lab goes through a lot of description about why you make one chemical limiting versus others. It has to do with cost, has to do with the efficiency of the reaction. I'm not going to go into all of that there. So there's some practical considerations. Great. So you've identified which one's limiting. You've identified which one's excess. That is one way of doing it. If your lecture professor tells you a different way, well, I can tell you a different way if you want to. Another way to do it is to take the grams of magnesium and do the three-step calculation and convert it into grams of oxygen, ignoring the amount of oxygen they have, and then compare how much oxygen you need to how much you have. That's another way of doing it. If you like that method, do it. I'm not going to show that method now. All right. 
So, now what do we do? Oh, actually, we did number two already. So we identify the limiting in the excess, determine the theoretical yield of MGL. Well, this technique gives that answer to us already. So since magnesium is limiting reactant, um, how much was formed? Okay, 0 0.0527. 0 0.0527 grams. Okay, uh, this video is going to go on too long, so I should have added number four here, determine a percent yield, but I think you can do percent yield. If you know the theoretical yield, then all you do for percent yield is put whatever you got in the experiment, which I didn't give you, divided by 0 0.0527 grams of MgO times 100. So say you go ahead and do the lab and you get 0 0.0315 grams. I just made that number up. You would put 0 0.0315 divided by the theoretical yield times 100, and you know something went wrong with your experiment if your yield is greater than 100%. That means usually your product is wet, it has impurities in it, so you can, you can never have greater than 100% yield. So that's just the bonus thing there. Okay, so the last question is excess reactant. Well, we know oxygen's excess, so only some of this 0 0.0527 grams is going to get consumed. So at the end of the reaction, no magnesium will be left. Some oxygen will be left. Well, let's just do this real quick. It's, uh, I think I need to make some more space. So we have the theoretical yield. That's fine. I think I'll just erase this. So now, well, how do we figure out how much oxygen was consumed? Well, do, kind of do what I said before. Take the magnesium and convert it into oxygen. That'll tell you how much oxygen is needed. That's all. It's pretty simple, actually, if you think about the chemistry. So take your limiting reactant, the mass of your limiting reactant, excuse me. So we're, it's like we're starting the equation. We're starting over again. Well, yeah, yeah. So we do that. I'm going to make this a little bit easier, 24 point. 305. You can do the units now. I'm being sloppy on purpose. You, you fill in the units. Uh, K is one mole. So somebody watching this video is like, yeah, I'm being sloppy here, but you can do this now. So the mole ratio is now 2 to 1. 2 in the denominator, 1 in the numerator. Okay, and then we just want to know grams of oxygen. So a mole of oxygen is 32 grams. Okay, very, very sloppy. So, do I have it set up right? Yeah. Convert to moles, ratio back to grams. 0 0.0318 times 32 equals this, divided by 2 equals that, divided by 24. Oops. If I had a graphing calculator, I could do this much faster. Oops. Sorry about that. Good. Divided by 2 equals that. Divided by 24.305. Also, what's nice about these problems, if you're paying attention, you kind of get some reassurance that you're doing it right. So the answer I got to three sig figs was 0 0.0209. Okay, so how do you how do you know that that has, is right? Well, what does this number mean? That is grams of oxygen actually consumed. I mean, put another way, that's, that's how much you need to do the reaction. You need 0 0.0209 grams of oxygen to completely react the given amount of magnesium. 
but you have a whole lot more. So how much is left? How much you have minus how much you need. Pat, need or excuse me, need, have. So that's not the answer to the question. The question was not how much is required to do the reaction. The, how, the question is how much of the excess reaction is remaining when it's done. So I could have said how much is actually needed. That's that answer. But how much is left over? Well, so therefore, if you know that symbol, 0 0.0527 grams minus 0 0.0209 grams, that will be how much is left over. probably a little bit more than you needed. I think you just did this in lecture uh, within the last day or two, depending on when you're watching this video. This is uh, week five of the semester, I think. Is that right? I think it's week five of the semester. All right. So before I erase all of this, the general procedure is the same. So please don't let it throw you when we start to have more complicated chemical formulas, which we will in the ACAC lab. And also in lab, we don't, always we don't always measure things in grams. Some things we have to measure because they're liquids. So we use a volume of a pure substance, a pure liquid. Well, that's fine. To go from a volume to a mass is easy. You just use density. That's no problem, okay? So, and sometimes we give you a solution that's a concentration, so it's not pure, it's a mixture. So we'll give you something like grams per liter or moles per liter later in the semester. So you just have to understand the information you're given Get it into something you understand like moles, and then go from there. But getting a little ahead of myself. So um, I'm going to erase all of this <laughs> and then put up the chemical equation for, which is already written in your lab notebook. So what we're looking at here is <laughs> that lab. And the chemical reaction is already here. It's not balanced. But what you want to get used to doing, and I guess I can just talk while I erase. You want to get used to a lab where we do a chemical reaction is balancing that chemical reaction via the chemical equation and then cataloging all the data that you'll have, which is going to require you to read the procedure. So you read the introduction, you get the chemical equation. Go to the procedure and that'll tell you how much of each chemical you're going to use so you're ready to go. So take a look at the procedure and see if you can start to pick out the amounts of each chemical and how we're giving it to you. Is it a solid? Is it a solution? Is it a pure liquid? What is it? So you'll, you'll do this on your own. So here I'm just rewriting what's in the introduction to the synthesis of uh, acetyl acetonate, iron 3 acetyl acetonate. And we're not worried about necessarily how these chemicals are structured. So you're taking iron chloride hexahydrate um, well it says AQ here but if you read the procedure so I'm looking at the procedure the way you're actually using it I'm not even going to bother with putting the subscripts for now okay is 270 milligrams, okay? Now right away, so uh, milligrams, so that's uh, 10 to the negative third gram, so it's, you, can, you can do the math, okay? So you're going to go to the balance room and mass out approximately 0 0.2700, because we have four sig figs, milligrams. So the procedure, uh, you get you sh this is what you want to shoot for. Don't worry if you don't get exactly this. Just record what you do. So don't use these numbers other than just an, a, a dry lab, a dry calculation. Okay. Um, and then you can look up on your own or calculate it the grams per mole. I'm not going to do that for you. So it's iron, three chlorines, and here's the trick, six water molecules. This is a hydrate, and we'll talk more about this in lab. These water molecules are essentially trapped inside the crystal structure. 
and when you dissolve it in water or do a chemical reaction, typically these water molecules are simply released. Uh, so you have to add that. If you want to do it, to be 12 hydrogens and 6 oxygens. Uh, you can always look this up in a table or even Google it. I think you could even Google iron 3 chloride hexahydrate. But I would do the math. Make sure you get the number of grams per mole. So there, that's, that's what you're doing with this one. This is not balanced, by the way. I'm not balancing it for you. Then what we're doing is we are adding to that um, sodium acetate, trihydrate. Okay, and how are we adding that? Okay, it says blah, 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 dissolve 500 milligrams. So you're dissolving all this in water, so that's why all the AQs are on here. Because you take it, you dissolve it in water, you take it, you dissolve it in water. But the original amount is done by mass. So we're taking 500 milligrams. Again, you'll put your exact mass in there, and you can look up the molar mass yourself. So sodium, two carbons, three hydrogens, two oxygens, and three water molecules. Fine. That's that's all that's on you. <laughs> and then we are adding, I'm gonna run out of space, but that's okay. You may want to turn your lab notebook sideways when you do this. Then we're adding um, the last reactant is uh, acetyl acetone, I think that's what it's called. Let's see how much we're adding there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's acetyl acetone. C5H8O2. But that's that's a pure liquid. So uh, mass wouldn't make a whole lot of sense here. So we're going to use a volume by using those Eppendorf pipettes. I don't know if I'm going like this. Most people know what those are. You dial in the volume and you go from there. We're using... 500 microliters. So 10 to the sixth, 10 to the, excuse me, 10 to the minus sixth liters. So if you wanted to convert that to milliliters, something a little bit easier to handle, you can do that yourself. So if it's 500 microliters, how many milliliters would it be? But since it's a um, liquid, you're also given the density, which is in the manual. and units of density are like they usually are. So it's a little less dense than water, but it's grams per milliliter, this is microliters, that's on you. And then you can also look up the molar mass. So these are three reactants, and this is not balanced. Okay? So then what all this is turning into is the chemical you're interested in, uh, called iron akak. It's a really interesting reaction. And that'll end up being a solid. Okay. This is what you base your calculations on. You're trying to determine the theoretical yield of iron 3 akak, acetyl acetonate. So grams of this should form if we mix all these together and then at some point you'll need the molar mass I don't think that's given to you anywhere in here it might be but anyway, you, you can find that out on your own um, obviously we can't balance the equation based on on just this I think I have that right yep so there's some byproducts Sodium chloride is a byproduct. Acetic acid is a byproduct. Uh, that's the active ingredient in vinegar. It's not an active ingredient, but it's the main ingredient in vinegar with water. And then you're actually producing water, free water molecules as well. Uh, so these you don't care about. 
these are byproducts, so we don't we, we don't we can't ignore them because we have to balance the equation. But for calculations, we're ignoring them. All right. So the basic idea here, and this video is getting pretty long, is based on these amounts of the three reactants, which one is the limiting reactant? Okay. And actually, if you read the introduction, there may be some common sense as to which one should be the limiting reactant. Maybe not. Well, if one is the limiting reactant, the other two must be the excess reactants. Fine. So then you'll determine the theoretical yield of what? Well, of this. That's, your, that's what you're after. So that's your theoretical yield. Then you'll determine the amounts of the two excess uh, reactants at the end. So the basic idea for your pre-lab, uh, most professors have you do this, is do, do this calculation as a pre-lab, balance the chemical equation, and then do the calculations. Just a little hint on balancing. This one is difficult to do just looking one atom at a time. This one is better if you look at groups of atoms. So what's actually going on here? So iron, here's iron 3 acac. Well, where's this big thing coming from? Well, this piece of the reaction is coming from the acetyl acetone. It's losing a hydrogen, but this is what becomes here. So we need three of those. So you might start by putting a three here. So look at groups of atoms, uh, whole molecules, whole ions, rather than just individual atoms. But spend some time on that, do the calculation, and you'll be ready for next week's lab. Thank you.